The video before you is an analysis of several design problems that arise from the video game representations of handedness. I will present solutions to these problems and analyze their implications, with the emphasis on singling out unique and thoughtful design. Have you ever paid any particular notice to the way the avatar holds the gun or a sword, or how they interact with the world and objects therein? Chances are you are right-handed and none of this has ever really caught your eye. It's usually lefties that care about the fictional representations of handedness. One scenario you might have noticed is that in some video games when you fire from the left side of the cover, your aim is somewhat obscured by the avatar, while in others it isn't. Those of you who appreciate the art of animation have certainly noticed that developers often cheat when dual weld pistols go empty and have the avatar reload them through a very cheap, unimaginative trick that's just short of magic. How did we arrive at any of these points? What are the solutions to these problems? Why does Arthur cock the hammer back on a shotgun, but when dual wielding them they magically cock themselves? If Lincoln switches hands, how is he going to reload the gun designed for a right-handed use with his left hand? And what does Bruce Willis have to do with any of that? There's quite a lot of video game history to unpack here, so let's start. Representations of handedness in video games started out with a lot of variety. A lot of variety, but not much thought. In 1974, an arcade game called Basketball was released. It was the first game to depict human characters as avatars. Basketball players were depicted as a single image of a human with both hands raised. Handedness was of no consequence. In 1975, Dungeons and Dragons was made, and its knight, although not animated, was decidedly right-handed. The same year Gunfight came out. Out. It is known as the first video game with violence, the first video game with the ability to kill a human being, and hands were a part of that rudimentary embodiment of Thanatos. Gameplay consisted of two cowboys fighting across a black void. When standing, these cowboys had no depth to them, and depending on your brain, you might interpret their stances as with either right or left hand pointing the gun. We know this isn't the case because of two reasons. Firstly, because of sprite mirroring. That was the usual 2D era practice of flipping the default fault usually right side facing character sprite when facing the left side of the screen. The other reason we know this is because their legs are animated in a way that adds depth to the image and no way this is a right foot or that this is a left one. This is the first instance where the side that the avatar is facing dictates how their handedness is represented, and it became a widespread trend in side scrolling shooters that came out in the following decades. This cowboy is also the first lefty in a video game. Sprite mirroring is a genre standard and a widespread practice that you'll find across most side-scrolling games of the time. And even in newer ones such as Cuphead and Don't Starve. Sprite mirroring was a war with symmetry from the start. Developers wanted characters to have interesting features in their appearance, and this makes the consistent image impossible, because these features are often side-specific. Eye patches would flip from one eye to the other in split second. Even where both sides of the sprite were seemingly symmetrical, there would be little giveaways such as how the kimono flaps overlap. There were only two ways to solve this, to draw sprites without distinguishing features on either side, making them bilaterally symmetrical, which is bland and boring, or to draw two unique sets of sprites and preserve the consistency of how characters' unique features are represented throughout the game. The first example I was able to isolate is Metroid 2, released in 1991. You play as Samus Aran, who has a distinguishing feature on one side of her body, a weapon mounted on her right hand as a part of her exoskeleton. Flipping the avatar would result in an inconsistency between the actual game and all the other representations of the character. This meant artists had to create two unique sets of sprites for each side of the screen, and this practice of consistency was kept throughout the sequels. The original Metroid had unused unique left side sprites, which indicates that consciousness of this inconsistency existed as early as 1986. What Metroid did with two sets of sprites wasn't common. I managed to find it in only a few other games. With 2.5D and 3D games, consistency became the norm. Characters existed within a digital space where they could turn around their own axis with side-specific features distinguishing their proper right or left side, preserving the integrity of their body and its sides. Handedness has a lot to do with the overall physicality of the avatar. If the general physicality is lower, handedness is less consequential. 
That's why we can't hold 2D platformers to the same standard of realism and consistency as 3D ones, or platformers to that of third and first person games. Disney's Tarzan, released in 99, was a 2.5D side-scrolling platformer with consistently right-handed avatar. No matter which side Tarzan faced when standing, swinging or holding onto a ledge, the weapon was always in his right hand. As this new paradigm of consistency is established, ambidextrous and left-handed characters begin to disappear. In GTA 3 and Mafia, we had a 3D avatar standing at the center of the screen, aiming around his axis with the same stance and animation. And it seemed like this would work for quite a while, without the need to change the now default right-handedness. But let's take a break from the third-person perspective for a second, just so as to keep some order to the timeline. We have to go back a few years. One of the most iconic hands you're first introduced in a game is actually a left hand, on a demon slayer. Now that's subversion. Doomguy throws punches and fires the pistol with his left hand and uses all other guns with his right. This is an early example of cross-dominance, a phenomenon where both hands are preferred but each for specific tasks. Not to be confused with ambidexterity, where both hands can be used with equal proficiency in all activities. Marshall Anderson from Outlaws is left-handed true and true and that's a rare example in an FPS. It really feels unique to see the right hand on the handguard or cocking the hammer back. So before the new millennium, we have all four categories, consistently left or right-handed, ambidextrous and cross-dominant. But these are mere examples of handedness in appearance across its natural spectrum. They are inconsequential to both the gameplay and the story, and a mere depiction of handedness in whatever variation isn't worthy of discussion if it doesn't have any consequences. My aim with this video is to explore how handedness complicates things for developers. In order for the phenomenon of handedness to manifest in more complex and interesting ways, there have to be two things. An interaction between the hand and an object, one that requires a higher degree of skill and dexterity, and an interaction between handedness as a mechanic and other in-game mechanics. The introduction of human and humanoid avatars brought the phenomenon of handedness into video games, but the need for them to have an interaction with the world created a design problem out of it. This is where things start to get interesting. I don't think that a specific point can be picked out, but over the years handedness became a factor in a sense that the interaction between the avatar and their environment expanded, and that there was more physicality to the avatar. Although rudimentary cover existed all the way back in 1975 with those two cowboys hiding behind Cacti, Tenchu and Metal Gear Solid introduced the mechanic in its now well-known third-person perspective variation. Even though it was just observative, non-combative, reduced to merely peeking behind the cover and taking note of your surroundings, it had established the scenario that is the core of the problem, a 3D model of a human leaning against an object that has two corners. In Tenchu you couldn't perform any actions while in cover until later in the series, but in Metal Gear Solid, Snake's handedness was an actual feature within the stealth mechanic. He always holds the gun in his right hand, establishing it as the dominant one. The only other action he can perform while in cover is knocking against the surface behind him, and handedness is an actual factor here. Depending on his position, he uses either his right or left hand, but if his dominant hand is occupied, he can knock with it only while stationary. This is the first instance that I could find where a character's handedness is so specifically represented in relation to another mechanic. So right at the beginning, we have variation in the representation of handedness that in my mind isn't merely practical. I would even say that it adds unnecessary complexity for the sake of craftsmanship. He could have simply done all the knocking with one hand. Winback created a problem that would later complicate things by adding the option to fire from cover. But since the avatar steps out of cover and rotates, firing from the same stance with a dominant hand on both sides, handedness wasn't an issue in this particular game. The avatar is consistently right-handed throughout whichever action he performs. The animation on both sides of the cover is the same, with the lower half of the body fixed and the upper half moving around its axis as you aim. Windback had taken the cover mechanic out of the stealth context, further complicating things with regards to handedness down the line, and it made cover-based shooting a part of video game ethos for years to come. Metal Gear Solid blended the features from its predecessor with those of Windback, bringing us an early example of a fully functioning stealth combat cover mechanic. This was basically the same system from Windback but with craftsmanship of a Metal Gear Solid game. The intricacies with regards to which hand does the knocking are preserved. 
The character can have the same posture when standing against an object and there's no complication there. But if they are to move along the horizontal line, there usually is a side-specific animation where the avatar faces the direction it moves towards. This creates an impression of spatial awareness and alertness. The same goes for peeking behind the cover. But walking, peeking and standing against the edge of cover, even when directional, can all simply be mirrored and the problem is solved. This is the most basic solution, and it isn't particularly interesting. But because these games are already in the 3D era, animations are mirrored, not images, and this can be done without affecting side-specific features of the avatar, except handedness. For the purpose of this video, I'll be referring to proper left and right when talking about hands, and use the viewer's perspective when referring to the cover. The problem for designers arises when an avatar is holding something in their hand, especially when that's something they can use in relation to what's behind the cover. Let's examine the making of the problem and solutions to it that were developed through history. The next evolutionary step was the original splinter cell, where the avatar could equip the gun and fire only while actively peeking from cover, without having to fully step out of cover and expose the whole body. This was done with the dominant hand exclusively and required two different animations depending on which end of the cover you're aiming from. This is the first example where handedness is consistently represented through two different animations in relation to the cover. If the avatar steps out of the cover, you can use the same animation, the way it was done in Windback and Metal Gear solid. The only thing that's different is the act of stepping out of cover. With this peak shooting mechanic, animators couldn't have mirrored the default animation without changing the avatar's dominant hand. It's really awkward and unnatural to try to aim with the right hand when standing against the edge on the left side of the cover. It's almost against the human anatomy. All three locking points, the shoulder, the elbow and the wrist, stretch and twist unnaturally. Animators of Splinter Cell did a good job. Sam moves his torso out to ease the angle and extends the arm, while the left hand is there to stabilize the whole posture. This is a great example where an animation in relation to handedness is designed to uphold the general aesthetic of the game, in this case the tactical stealth feel that the game was aiming for. As you can see, the cover mechanic introduced an interesting problem in relation to handedness. For this particular problem to arise, the mechanic had to go from this to this consistently representing Avatar's dominant hand became a problem. This is where handedness becomes inherently tied to the cover mechanic and evolves with it. Most games analyzed beyond this point will be shooters, simply because in order for handedness to manifest beyond mere appearance, the Avatar has to use an object, preferably one that requires skill and dexterity. Other genres naturally contain the phenomenon of handedness, but with far less complication and interaction. Although Killswitch is often cited as the first example of the blind fire mechanic, the Getaway, released in 2002, was actually the first to implement it. Blind fire mechanic only amplified the problem of handedness in relation to the cover mechanic from the original Splinter Cell. This is the crossroads of how handedness is going to be represented in video games for years to come, and principles established here will be imitated for decades. The Getaway and Killswitch gave different solutions to the same problem. In both games you have two types of cover, high where you can shoot only from its sides or openings, and low where in addition to those two you can also shoot above the cover. In the Getaway for both options you have two principal stances out of which every side specific action emerges. Avatar with his back straight against the wall or or crouching in front of cover, without any positioning specific to either side. They are like a foundation upon which the rest of the cover system is built, except in the case of popping out to the sides while crouching, which has a unique animation of what must be a special kind of discomfort. This animation is mirrored on the left side of the cover. Outside of dual wielding, this is the only time the avatar shoots with his left hand. Killswitch is basically a prototype of a video game based entirely on the cover mechanic. Like the getaway, its cover system allowed both peek out and blind fire from six cover stances. This would require a unique firing animation if the actions were to be performed consistently with the dominant hand. In order to simplify it, they've made the character ambidextrous. Some stances and animations are mirrored, others not quite. He leans against the wall in a neutral right-handed stance and then adjusts it depending on the direction. Like the getaway, Killswitch has a neutral right-handed stance, but all the other stances are side-specific and alter his grip. Crouching stance isn't simply mirrored, there's animation for reloading and throwing grenades with both hands. 
this system was considerably more layered compared to that of the getaway. These two examples open up a very important question. Both games feature situational and dexterity. The avatars can use their left hand or both hands simultaneously only in specific cases such as a kimbo and cover mechanic. For the rest of the game they are consistently right-handed. To me this shows that their dexterity is merely a technical solution to a particular problem and not a true representation of handedness. Regardless of the nature of these two representations, they still depict handedness in appearance. And between Snake, Hammond and Bishop, a spectrum of handedness begins to appear. And within it, unique trends, at times independent of the real life phenomena. But if we challenge this spectrum in terms of its physicality, its origin within the game, its consistency, what do we get? There are consistent representations of Avatar's handedness between the cover mechanic and the rest of the game. And there are inconsistent representations, or what I think it's only appropriate to call degrees of ambidexterity. I think this is appropriate because the phenomenon of ambidexterity has developed its own logic within the context of video games. It's important to note that the real life definition of ambidexterity wouldn't fit many of the video game avatars. In order for the depiction of ambidexterity to be consistent, it would have to be an option throughout the whole game, not just the cover mechanic. Nobody can really give the final word on whether Hammond is ambidextrous or just clumsily using his left hand in two specific situations when it's obvious that even developers didn't think of handedness on any narrative level beyond a technicality. There would have to be some nuance between how each hand is animated, some distinction, discrepancy for this to be the case. Since it isn't, we are in this weird situation where we have to accept something for what we perceive it as, knowing that it's in fact a mere technicality. So to make things a little bit clearer and to try to untangle the previous passage, Max Payne is the synonym for dual wheel. But he would take the place right at the beginning of this spectrum because although he uses the left hand quite prominently and effectively, he does so only while dual wielding. Mark Hammond would be here because he uses the left hand in cover as well. And Bishop would take place here because within the game's cover system he is fully ambidextrous. While the getaway was more like a combination between Winback and Splinter Cell, Killswitch brought to the table a more aggressive combative system. This is an important branch off in the evolution of the cover mechanic that will have a significant impact on the depiction of handedness down the line. While Pandora Tomorrow copied the original game, Chaos Theory branched off into a whole new category. There's no longer a peek and shoot option, there isn't even a cover system. It's replaced by the shoulder swap feature that switches Avatar's hands. This is the first instance that I could find where the shoulder swap feature changes hands, effectively making the character ambidextrous in all firearm related combat. Sam shoots, reloads and fixes his goggles with both hands. He still has a clear preference for the right hand outside of this mechanic when interrogating, slashing tarp or when shooting while climbing. But this new flexibility with regards to handedness places him at the top of this ambidextrous subspectrum. You can change hands at any point while aiming. And this is the closest thing we have to true ambidexterity at the time. Considering that this isn't a traditional shooter and you can play it with minimal violence, you can specifically choose to play this game in such a way as to always fire the gun with only the left hand. This isn't possible in The Getaway or Max Payne and it makes quite an important distinction. Left handedness is the best test of ambidexterity in video games. If you can choose to play as left handed, that's a sign of a high degree of ambidexterity. The extent to which left handedness is animated makes the avatar ambidextrous. On this spectrum, shoulder switching is higher than dual wielding because it gives more active control over hands. Design principles established early on remain throughout the decade. For years we had games that simply copied these solutions. Indiana Jones and the Emperor's Tomb is fully consistent with the initial depiction of Indy's handedness. Snake Eater preserves the series tradition. Then there was Manhunt, Bad Boys game, Second Sight, PsyOps, True Crime New York City, 50 Cent Bulletproof, The Matrix, Path of Neo, Siphon Filter, Dark Mirror, The Godfather, Winback 2 of course, Miami Vice, and Scarface. All these characters are right handed. None of these games have blind fire and so old solutions to old problems still work. This is essentially the same old cover system from Winback and Splinter Cell. A couple of interesting things happen along the way, namely the two James Bond games. Everything or Nothing was first to introduce a mixed approach, based not on the type of cover like in the getaway, but the type of firearm. All firearms are always held and reloaded with the right hand. One handed weapons are fired with the dominant hand regardless of the size 
side of the cover, resulting in two drastically different stances similar to the splinter cell, while all longer guns are fired with the left hand from the left side of the cover. This is done in order to avoid this awkward and uncomfortable position from the getaway. The gun doesn't simply teleport, there is an animation for the switch. The getaway developers thought that the shooting with the left hand in that one particular case wasn't justified. And in the sequel they've addressed this, there's even a nice new animation when leaning out of cover while crouched, where the avatar rests on his left hand for stability instead of shooting with it. It looks a lot more natural and comfortable compared to the old one. Fire for effect, known also as Nemesis Strike, is an exact mechanical copy of Kill Switch, and this shows how ambidexterity and more aggressive forms of cover that required it were slower to spread through the industry in the beginning. Gears of War is often credited with popularizing the cover system. In reality, at least nine other games released that year had it as a mechanic, eight of which were released before the original Gears of War. What it did is continue the legacy of Kill Switch, creating a distinctly aggressive sense of movement with respect the cover. With regards to handedness, it had slightly expanded the ambidextrous option within the cover to cover feature, where hands are switched in the middle of the animation. And unlike 007 games where the gun goes back into the right hand for the reload, Marcus can perform the reload with either hand and waltz the cover with whatever hand is free at the moment. Rogue Trooper is an important and interesting branch off. It has the blind fire mechanic, but the avatar remains right handed throughout all animations. What's important here is that the animation for blind fire is representative of what it should feel like compared to proper aiming. The arm is extended in an uncomfortable position and it barely controls the gun as it jumps all over the place. Rainbow Six Vegas also had blind fire of precisely this variation. Up to this point blind firing was the line between right-handed and ambidextrous cover shooting. The animation in Vegas is particularly persuasive of Logan's right-handedness. He pushes the gun out and holds its stock with his left hand in order to stabilize it. It doesn't feel like a mere technicality. The grip is still somewhat uncomfortable, character flinches while firing a shotgun and clenches his teeth on fully automatic fire, making a strained grimace. It feels rather authentic and unique. With this unique animation, Rogue Trooper and Vegas had given another solution to that same problem of blind firing that Kill Switch solved by introducing ambidexterity. Advanced Warfighter games and Vegas gave a tactical feel to their cover systems, and Avatar's handedness was decidedly a part of that. It was a new form of cover, not as aggressive as the one in Kill Switch, nor stealth based as that of Metal Gear. Even though these games featured sliding into cover, vaulting, cover to cover switch, they had a much more tactical feel and aesthetic compared to that of Gears of War, and it makes sense that a more grounded approach to handedness was used. And the dexterity as a solution was quite slow to spread. It was ignored until Gears of War, and even after that it didn't become the norm, despite the widespread influence of that game. The tradition of consistently right-handed characters was duly upkept. All of these characters, blind firing or not, convenient or awkward, were right-handed. This led to some interesting solutions and variety in animations. Most games simply copied the original winback, and that is a testament to how simply brilliant that innovation was. I have to single out the GTA 4 here. When you insist on an avatar being right-handed in all situations, this inevitably leads to some interesting animations. GTA 4 took consistency to another level. It featured a cover system with blind fire option as well as quite a number of weapon types. This created a lot of variety in animation. In all three stories from Liberty City, not once did they reach for the convenience of ambidexterity and mirroring. Across this system, patterns are formed, of course, but still, think about how many different weapon types, grips, modes of fire had to be accommodated. Handedness helped to portray Nico as an ordinary guy with war experience compared to super soldiers from Kill Switch and Nemesis Strike. Army of Two didn't have a dedicated cover system that could be initiated with a button, but a combination of a crouching stance with waist-high objects would result in blind firing above cover, all from a single stance. This context-sensitive cover didn't change much how handedness was represented. Later installments introduced a stickier form of cover and fully ambidextrous characters, capable of firing with both hands from every stance, including when outside of cover as the shoulder switch changes the grip. At the same time, a whole category was dying out. The practice of having the avatar use their left hand in one specific situation and otherwise prefer the right branched out on its own. This particular variety established in the getaway I've managed to find in only several other games. Quantum of Solace, Terminator Salvation, Eat Lead, L.A. Noir, 
In Logan's Shadow, left hand was used on the left side of the cover, regardless of whether it's blind firing or proper aiming, except when blind firing with a handgun. And the 007 branch, where the left hand on the left side of the cover is used only when firing longer guns, was featured in Reservoir Dogs and Saboteur. There are fewer and fewer characters that switch hands only while using longer weapons. That practice slowly dies out in favor of ambidexterity that doesn't discriminate between the weapon types. Ambidexterity that's a result of mirrored animation simplifies the design process and streamlines the gameplay. This trend of cutting corners and simplifying things inevitably led to some variety dying out, and with it some unique solutions. The 007 variety was the first to go. In 2009, something happens and we get quite a few ambidextrous avatars. Blood on the Sand, obviously under the influence of Gears of War, had a very fluent cover system that made the gunfight streamlined and dynamic. There were more and more ambidextrous characters and they started becoming ambidextrous to a greater degree. Red Faction Guerrilla, Resistance Retribution and Jonathan Cain the Protector. So far I've isolated some interesting representations of handedness, but none are a match to what the Demon Souls brought to the table. Both hands are available as separate slots and bound to different buttons, which was seen earlier and was implemented in order to separate the shield that blocks and the sword that slashes. But now you can equip one item in either hand or wield it in both hands, which creates a variety of attack types and movesets. This system that was more than just dual wielding brought a dose of complexity that far overshadows what we've seen in Max Payne or Killswitch. Everything that came after, including all the Dark Souls games, was just a variation or a logical improvement of this system. Quite expectedly, RPGs are the one to expand the spectrum of ambidexterity. But the use of the left hand did come with penalties and limitations. Moves sets were restrictive for most attack types, preventing follow-up combos. You couldn't use strong attacks, blocking was done by the sword, weapons in the left hand couldn't be two-handed. It is obvious that the use of the left hand was meant more as a defensive option, like in many games before. Although the left hand still has a rudimentary melee attack, it's hard to string attacks with both hands, as there is a delay between them. And the left hand weapon can only block or parry, it cannot do both as the shield. On the surface level this appears to us as an ambidextrous avatar. When when all technicalities are taken into account, it becomes more of a grey area. With all the penalties and missing features, it's clear that the left hand is stuck between an equally dominant one on an ambidextrous avatar and an off hand on a righty. It simply does not allow for true left-handed gameplay. Despite that, this weird skeleton of a system was in the game and available to players to use however they saw fit. However inconvenient, you could choose to play as a very limited left-handed character from the beginning of the game. This would make the game a lot harder and I couldn't find any confirmation that it was actually done by anybody. In Dark Souls you could two-hand a bow even when in the left hand, for convenient switching between melee and range combat. An important distinction was made in Dark Souls 2, where you could play the whole game as a functional left-handed avatar by choice. There's even a weapon that has a unique and stronger moveset when wielded in the left hand. And what's more, the lore supports that. An option to two-hand the weapon in the left hand is introduced, with that distinctive left over right hand grip. Dark Souls 2 made the distinction between simple dual wielding where each weapon in either hand had a full individual moveset and both weapons could be two-handed, compared to its unique mechanic, the power stance, which had a unique moveset that allows you to attack with both weapons simultaneously. This worked for all weapons that had the same attack type, slash on slash, thrust on thrust. Because of this you could pair a dagger and a spear, even two crossbows. Even though this significantly expands the degree of ambidexterity, there are still penalties for the left hand. Chosen Undead, Barrier of the Curse, Ashen One and Tarnished are all ambidextrous, but because of this damage penalty for the left hand, they could be seen as the ultimate depiction of a right-handed avatar with operational capacity of the left hand. This brings us back to that problem of balancing on a conceptual level between a real-life and video game spectrum of handedness, which are closely connected but still independent of each other. Here we have an important difference between Max Payne and Dark Souls, with Max using the left hand only in three specific cases, while the Hollowed can use their left hand from the start as the player sees fit. 
proper ambidexterity and circumstantial ambidexterity, if we look at it from a video game point of view, if we look at it from a purely technical standpoint, Max's left hand is equally proficient, while Demon Hunter's has a damage penalty, and the categorization would be the other way around. We could also choose to see Max as a right-handed character adapting to a specific situation, but the proficiency of usage remains the same, and that is certainly a strong argument for ambidexterity, or a degree of it. The same is true of the Assassin's Creed series, although you get the option to control two hidden blades, the keys are tied to the weapon type, not the hand. If you have only one blade, you control that hand, if you have two, you control both hands with the same key. Note that ambidexterity in Souls games is still just a technicality. Even with the option to play as left-handed, there are still actions performed exclusively with the right hand, and there's canon depictions in art and cutscenes with a clear preference for the right hand. Right-handedness is still the default option you have to choose to switch hands or dual wield weapons. One action I find to be always performed with the left hand was opening doors, even when awkward. From here on out, things begin to even out, and ambidexterity as a solution begins to take foothold. On one side we have these games. And on the other... In principles, games with rudimentary cover systems such as Sniper Elite use the old win-back formula. Third-person shooters in general wildly adopt the kill switch variant, and a shoulder switch that changes hands as seen in Chaos Theory becomes the norm. If you paid attention to the year of release, you saw that exclusively right-handed avatars are on a path to become a minority. First-person shooters, although rarely featuring a cover mechanic, practice consistency. Since both hand and gun are always present in the frame, it's more convenient this way, otherwise mirrored animation would require hand switching to be animated or for one hand to disappear and the other to appear in split second. Dark Void introduced a vertical cover that by its positioning didn't have the problem of handedness at all. The avatar stands parallel to the cover on its edge overlooking everything below and single sweeping animation is enough to cover the whole view. Same principle as in top down perspective, so even with this consistency is preserved. Enough time has passed for a certain amount of variety in design to accumulate across the spectrum so that trends within series and studios can be recognized. Uncharted started out with Drake as consistently right-handed on all sides of cover, but moved towards full ambidexterity with the sequel and from there it became the norm. Hitman and The Last of Us did the opposite. Absolution and Part 1 have ambidextrous characters both inside and outside the cover system. In both games the shoulder swap feature changes hands. In Hitman 2016 and Part 2, avatars are exclusively right-handed.
In GTA 5 as well as binary domain, there are direct references for Vegas for example. In Wanted the same animation as in The Getaway. We can track a design philosophy and specific solutions through different titles. Rockstar games have the most interesting history. Outside of blind firing on the left side in LA Noir, all of their games are stubbornly consistent in their depiction of right-handed avatars. Awkward, inconvenient, doesn't matter. Which is why Red Dead 2 came as a surprise to me. To abandon a long-standing tradition of consistency and in a western nonetheless seems wrong. One reason that comes to mind as to why they might have done this is the interaction between handedness and firearm mechanics. The cover mechanic, however much it made things more interesting for representations of handedness, is only one part of the story. The issue of how to represent handedness is further complicated by the fact that most firearms and other objects in general are designed for right-handed use, and the dexterity that was a solution within the cover mechanic became a problem in itself. Somewhere along the line, avatars shooting with their left hand on the left side of cover had split into two groups, one that shoots with the left hand but changes hands for a reload, and one that both shoots and reloads with the left hand. Although it took some time for developers to start depicting right-handed operation correctly, most video games already have a roughly correct right-hand animation for a right-handed firearm. The issue is always how to accommodate that left hand. Changing hands just for a reload after using the weapon with the same proficiency is fundamentally wrong. A challenge that developers create for themselves and then ignore it. Why use that left hand as a way to streamline shooting only to have this awkward switch during reloads? If the avatar is able to aim, take shots and control the recoil, why can't they operate the rest of the gun? Between wrong reload animations and incorrect gun models, the issue of representing handedness in video games in relation to firearms really comes down to representing left handed operation. In the early days developers reached for a tried and tested solution like mirroring, that laziest of options from the age of 2D sprites. In games like Kill Switch, this wasn't really an issue because weapon models were low poly, lacked distinguishable details in moving parts. You couldn't really tell that the gun was mirrored. In Gears of War this is far more obvious as firearms are more detailed. The integrity of the avatar itself is preserved as there is no need to mirror his model and because of this mirrored animations don't stick out. But firearm models are flipped on the spot, magically, the same way it was done in Metal Slug, some more obviously than others, like the sniper rifle with its bolt sticking out on the side. It's undeniable that this solution works, but firearms have their own mechanical realities and consequences, which video games started to depict with more and more fidelity, which makes the mistake stick out more obviously. This problem was inevitable. Attention to detail and character's handedness were on a collision course from the start. It's pointless to have all these moving parts if hands aren't going to interact with them. As developers pushed boundaries, they've pushed a higher standard onto themselves. This complicates the reloading animation and its relation to avatar's handedness. A non-amidextrous firearm cannot be reloaded the same way with both hands. In Days Gone, a game whose weapon models are rendered in great detail, mirroring feels really disappointing. In one moment it is one thing and in the next it is another. It's magic, a supernatural power in a realistic game where you have to keep track of fuel consumption and scavenge for resources. The question poses itself, why do we have to follow all the other rules when magic obviously exists in this world? It destroys the very premise of the benefit of the doubt. It goes directly against the way Deacon looks, the danger he and his friends face, the fact that he sleeps in an abandoned lookout tower, the brilliant weather system. These magical guns are at odds with with everything that's right about this game. Mirroring weapons as a way to pair and with dexterity and firearm mechanics ends up becoming a problem out of which arises a creative challenge. To have both a realistic weapon model and a correct reload animation for whichever hand is operating the gun. Another way to reconcile firearm mechanics and with dexterity is to have partial reloads. A lot of games simply don't have empty reloads as a solution to this problem. Animating only the ambidextrous portion of the reload, such as the magazine insert. This started in Chaos theory and took foothold throughout the mechanic. Reloading is not complete in order to avoid specificities of firearm design. A pattern of ignoring the fact that a left-handed usage of a right-handed design would require a unique set of animation is firmly established early on. The most convenient way to solve this problem was to use firearms that have ambidextrous design in the first place and allow for neutral reloads. Some games ignore the magazine release on a pistol since without that side-specific action the rest of the reload can be performed with either hand 
if the slide is racked instead of using the slide release, but that's a cheap shot. If shotguns are always loaded from below, ignoring the ejection port, they're operationally ambidextrous. Games like Blood on the Sand use this prominently, but they also feature other guns like the AK or HK platform, which have side-specific operation. Reload animations are still mirrored, but the charging handle is visibly on the other side of the hand pulling it. Here you can clearly see the avatar engaging a non-existent charging handle. They've mirrored the animation, but not the weapon model. Whoever put together this model and this animation must have seen that there isn't a charging handle on this side. The positioning of the slide release is the reason they've made the default animation in the first place. In fictional settings, this is often the norm. Simply design the guns to be ambidextrous by default, so that you don't have a problem when those gun models start interacting with shoulder switch, cover and handedness. Resident Evil 6 is a good example of this. This assault rifle has a charging handle on top instead of on the sides, and the shotgun is made neutral by always using the loading port. The cylinder on the grenade launcher swings out on both sides. In futuristic setting, it often makes sense that guns would be ambidextrous by default, since that is a more intelligent design that fits everyone. But one of the reasons for this is obviously to accommodate handedness. Sometimes a historic design is fictionally made ambidextrous. So the problem after decades of cutting corners seems to be solved, or rather avoided. Make everything ambidextrous together with the avatar. But there are firearms like revolvers and bolt-action rifles, often used out of historic necessity or for their cool factor, and they tend to cause problems. Revolvers are usually a good test for consistency because the cylinder swings out to only one side. As you can imagine, this resulted in a lot of mirrored cylinders. A more acceptable way to circumvent this problem is to use stop break revolvers, which aren't fully ambidextrous as there is a side-specific lever that opens the frame, but with that function ignored, it appears ambidextrous. The same goes for the sawed-off shotgun. You see the pattern here, a problem arises and it's solved through avoidance rather than being tackled directly. A top break revolver is just that, less animation, but less animation is less chance to show skill and love for the craft. All these examples reveal the true nature of this supposed ambidexterity. It's simply fake, inconsequential, something developers have introduced to streamline one problem and then ran from it for decades, acknowledging it mostly through mistakes. It is always used without much thought or consequence. But I don't want to just split hairs on this particular problem. This video really is about positive examples. And what I've showcased so far is merely to establish the context and flesh out dominant trends. There are in fact some very interesting examples of solutions to this problem. It could be said that with the introduction of the cover mechanic, the leftorium is no morium. It really does seem as if everyone's either right-handed or ambidextrous. But this wouldn't be entirely true. All the righties definitely dominate in video games, especially shooters, there's quite a number of lefties as well, mostly in fighting and fantasy games. There is, however, one particularly interesting example. Resident Evil 5 is surprisingly the peak when it comes to representations of handedness. Throughout its main story, you play as Chris, who is consistently right-handed. If you use the co-op option, the other player controls Sheva, who is left-handed. The reason behind this decision might have been the desire to preserve symmetry during the co-op. Player 1 fills up the bottom left corner while player 2 takes the right one, symmetrically aiming towards the center. Once you complete the game, you have the option to play as Sheva in the new game plus. And the brilliant thing is that she remains a lefty. She uses the same weapons as Chris, models of which are not mirrored for her. Instead, she has a unique set of animation. And these animations are such a joy to watch. They reveal the dedication and artistry of human beings behind this work. I don't believe that this is just stubborn insistence on crude logic of hand and firearm mechanics, rather the sheer love of the craft. They didn't complicate things unnecessarily, they've simply depicted a variation of how a left-handed person would operate a right-handed firearm. Animation for pistols are still mirrored, shotguns as well, but her animations for revolvers and bolt-action rifles are just pure beauty. She has to tilt the revolver to the side in order to insert the shells. She works the bolt over the rifle. It's not only correct and visually interesting, but somehow proper on a more integral level. The creativity of the animation team is immortalized through these animations. Compare these examples to something as lazy and unimmersive as The Last of Us and Days Gone. 
Ironically, this grounded approach would fit both these games a lot more than it does something out of the Resident Evil series. This game established a whole new paradigm. Two characters with corresponding sets of animation and correct firearm models and operation. Why is this such a big deal is best exemplified by its sequel, where they wanted to have ambidextrous avatars but found the left-handed set of animations to be too inconvenient, so they resorted back to mirroring and fictional ambidextrous design. Sheva's animation set is an example where handedness matters and is of consequence and where problems it creates are solved boldly. As you can imagine, this didn't create any legacy and remained more of a hidden gem, but there are recent examples where developers have followed through with mechanical ambidexterity. The original Division and Mafia 3 were both released in 2016 and both featured protagonists with special training. Whether or not that bit of lore is enough to accept their ambidexterity is something I leave to you. What's great about it is that this ambidexterity is actually of consequence and finally given its full mechanical representation. Both games feature a lot of weapon types so this gives us a lot of variety in animation. This variety complicates the animation of both the firing and non-firing hand in its relation to firearm design. The hand has to go over or under the gun depending on where the charging handle is. Some firearms appear easier to reload with the right hand as non-dominant. This further complicates things by creating a spectrum of ambidextrous design within a spectrum of ambidexterity itself. Both games still take shortcuts with semi-auto pistols and shotguns, by ignoring the magazine release and the loading port on the side. Mafia 3 even uses a shotgun that's ambidextrous by design as it has only one port, used for both loading and ejecting shells, and it's under the gun. For these guns animations are simply mirrored as everything fits on either side. All reloads are treated as empty reloads so there's no complication with reloading single rounds. Revolvers and bolt action rifles are still the most interesting variety visually. They even offer different solutions for the left-handed bolt action reload. Essentially this is Chris and Sheva in a single avatar. Uncharted 4 was released the same year, and although earlier games in the series simply mirror their reload animations, here we get unique sets for certain weapons. The game also cheats by not having empty reloads for certain guns, and it uses the same pistol and shotgun shortcuts as Division and Mafia. There's a lot of repetition since most guns reuse the same animation. Revolver and bolt action rifle have correct animations for each hand. But there's something else. Let me first show it to you. Did you see that? This beautiful preposterous thing. I'd love to see somebody do it in real life just to see if it's possible. The game has three cover stances. For two, both hands are used to operate the gun and ambidexterity is preserved. With the third one, only one hand is used since the other one is leaned onto. Because of this, all actions are performed with only one hand. With most firearms they use plain magic instead of proper reloads. But even the existence of these animations shows an important awareness of the interaction between handedness and firearms. Since Mafia Remake uses Lincoln's animations we see the same system applied to Tommy as well. This new category of consistent ambidexterity in third person with correct firearm models and reloads actually had its first appearance a bit earlier. The original Watch Dogs has an ambidextrous avatar using non-mirrored firearms. In order to blend the two, the game uses partial reloads. This allowed all reload animations to be mirrored. It doesn't matter on which side the charging handle is if it's never engaged. This obviously wouldn't work on a revolver. See how they were running away from extra animations for the left hand, but the design of a revolver made them do just that. Otherwise they would have had to mirror the gun. Another aspect affected by handedness were the stealth takedowns. Sometimes they can be mirrored, but in Double Agent they've made different variations, not necessarily changing the dominant hand in the process. Another example of two different animations for each hand is from the original Soldier of Fortune. For some reason you could switch the silver talent to the left hand. The model isn't mirrored and it has a unique reload animation when in the left hand. The same issue is widely present in the dual wielding mechanic and brings its own unique problems. Initially we have the same solutions as in third person games, mirroring and partial reloads, and a new invention, disappearing guns. Some years later another branch off appears, one where both guns are present on screen the whole time. 
There's quite a lot of these partial reloads where only the magazine is inserted and the slide or slide release are never engaged and they feel like partial creativity, as if something was abandoned. This is because handedness complicates animation. Sometimes a single gun has a full reload but in dual wielding it's either partial or done off screen. Alien vs Predator is the earliest example of handedness acknowledged through animation while dual wielding and it's quite brilliant. The avatar takes hold of both pistols with his right hand, inserts both magazines at the same time and racks both slides simultaneously. This way everything is technically correct even though there are two unique animations for each hand. And although it would be hard to pull off in real life, the animation ticks all the boxes. Correct models, correct function, both guns on the screen the whole time. Another example of developers following through with them dexterity. This was in 99 and it was an innovation before the problem became really obvious. Being a somewhat unconventional solution, I couldn't find many similar examples. These games and mods seem like direct influences. Pretty soon another great example followed. In Return to Castle Wolfenstein, both guns stay on screen, magazine is inserted into each and then both slides are racked, all the while both pistols are in hand. This was in 2001 and it will remain the peak of the representation of handedness in first person shooters while dual wielding for quite some time. Alien vs Predator 2 had pretty much the same animation, as well as Turtle Rock Studio style animations mod for the original Left 4 Dead. One notable example is the obscure boiling point, where a Kimbo Uzi isn't mirrored and although magazine inserting is hidden, both guns are cocked with the other in hand. To me, the superiority of these two examples over the great majority of akimbo reloads that came after is self-evident. Most of the time, the dexterity of an avatar is purely a means to empower the player with an extra cool factor. Through these details, developers acknowledge both the phenomenon of handedness and firearm design and the interaction between the two. Dual wielding in general is unrealistic, but if it's going to be in a game, it's better to have it actually represented and properly animated. Both before as well as years after these examples, we've had games whose reload animation ignored handedness and its correlation with dual wielding in firearm design. Guns go click, disappear from the screen empty, some finicking sounds are played and then they're brought back locked and loaded. Handedness and physicality inconsequential. In some instances a Kimbo reload would be faster than on a single pistol. Kind of cartoonish this history of magic. Dual wielding is generally disappointing when it comes to the representations of handedness. Far Cry Instincts and Vengeance both have magical reloads, but none of the Akimbo models are mirrored, which is still a nice touch for a 2005-2006 game. Revolvers are a headache as usual because of the prominent cylinder that makes the error of mirroring very obvious. There is a revolver with a cylinder that swings out to the right, but these are not that revolver. In Call of Juarez, revolvers were reloaded one at a time, like in Marathon, maintaining correct models and using two unique reload animations for each handgun, down to the little details such as closing the loading ports. This was preserved throughout the sequels. Since each hand is a separate slot, you can mix akimbo pairs, quote from the bible while shooting or play as left handed exclusively. Even though this is obvious from the inventory bar, I've realized it only after one of the guns exploded and I proceeded to play as left handed. Bound and Blood goes so far to accurately depict both top levers moving only to one side. For comparison, Modern Warfare Remastered simply mirrors this part. Gunslinger is a step back because both guns use the same animation. One at a time on screen reload is just like any other non akimbo reload if there isn't a different animation for the left hand. By this point there was enough variety in akimbo reloads that they could be held to a higher standard. In the cartel the animation ignores the cylinder release and it is somehow forced out. In Killing Floor everything is animated properly, even the fictional flare gun revolver has unique animations and the flashlight is turned on differently based on whether the avatar is holding one or two pistols. The animation for dual Berettas and Eagles is still incorrect since the avatar engages a phantom slide release on the right side of the left gun. Modern Warfare 2 did recognize the fact that its avatar is using a non-ambidextrous design ambidextrously. Colt has a cylinder release on the left face of the gun that has to be pulled back in order to free the cylinder. 
it looks like this. See how the wrist has to be bent to the side in order for the thumb to be able to reach the release point. This design is a real test for the opposable thumbs. It's kind of awkward. If you're holding the gun in the left hand, it's even more awkward and requires a different technique. Modern Warfare 2 pulled it off nicely with the index finger bending back. The screen is full of stainless steel as those two big guns are tilted to the side, left one to a different angle, making the animation even more unique. It looks quite good and directly acknowledges the fact that something different is happening because of handedness in firearm design. The actual reload we don't see. In the usual Call of Duty fashion, this animation is then reused in Black Ops 1 and 2, Modern Warfare 3 and Ghosts. The game features a fictional ambidextrous Glock 18, and during the akimbo reload, the avatar engages the slide stop closest to the thumb, but when riding the snowmobile, he releases the slide by bending the index finger back. That's the inconvenient way, since the gun is ambidextrous, but it's a nice bit of variety that's easy to miss in all that chaos. In the remastered version, Glocks aren't ambidextrous, and the avatar tries to engage a non-existent slide stop. Modern Warfare 2 also had the option to force dual wielding on certain weapons through console commands, and it looks like this. Now try to unsee that. The Darkness sequel features a Kimbo option prominently. None of the guns are mirrored, although they are reloaded off screen. For some reason, they've animated the act of cocking the hammer before releasing the cylinder, which isn't done on modern revolvers. But I like the extra animation, even when incorrect, over nothing at all. Partial reloads are better than magic, and mirrored models and animations are better than partial reloads. Technically, they are correct within the game's world, even though we know that they are mirrored out of convenience and have no real counterparts in our world. Deadfall Adventure is a good example of this. It features a lot of akimbo handguns prominently, and although models and animations were mirrored, reloading is actually animated and on screen. It is much better to have wrong models on screen than nothing at all. But I'm in search of an animation that has everything correct and done on screen, no shortcuts whatsoever. It cannot be that nobody wanted to do it all these years after Castle Wolfenstein. I've only managed to find an obscure mod for Half-Life that basically does the same thing. Payday 2 recognized an important detail. Call of Duty series had a lot of animations with a phantom slide release. This meant that the reload was correct only in those cases where the design of the handgun was ambidextrous itself, either through artistic license, real life design or mirroring of the models. Otherwise, the left thumb is pressing something that doesn't exist. In Payday, this is directly acknowledged but not fixed. Models aren't mirrored and only the right thumb is animated. This, paired with the fact that the avatar practices good trigger discipline, creates an illusion that the left index finger is pressing the slide on the left side. If it's deliberate, it's a nice trick. The left index finger does in fact move, but only to get to the trigger again. On some handguns, it is more obvious than on others. Here we clearly see that the finger doesn't move. The absence of mirroring is in fact a recognition of the problem. We also see this in Max Payne add-on for the Gmod. Interestingly, Payday does have a correct ambidextrous reload for one of the revolvers, although just for releasing the cylinder, like in the Call of Duty series. Wolfenstein reboots have distinct firearm design, and mirroring them would result in a very lazy form of symmetry. Thanks to consistency, we have some interesting variations. Shock Hammer has the best animations in the series. Depending on which gun you're reloading or changing its fire mode, BJ uses a different animation. Gun on the left is reloaded with only the right hand, for the right one he uses both. The fire selector is on the left side so he has to go over the left gun to push it, while he merely taps the right one. In the new Colossus, fire selectors are made ambidextrous, but now instead of partial reloads we get unique animation for each hand. Modern Warfare Reboot changed the type of the revolver, from Colt to Smith imitation, which has a different cylinder release, one that has to be pushed forward, but it's erroneously pulled back. The animation is still partially magical because the main thing happens off screen, but they've made it more complex, more dexterous. Avatar moves the hands up and holds the frame of the gun to get a better grip, while performing two different cylinder release animations. This is also done with all the other akimbo options, with both the magazine and slide release engagement correctly animated on the left side. And to unlock another level of hair splitting just for the sake of it. Some handguns in Modern Warfare have ambidextrous commands by default and don't need to have that left index finger bent so uncomfortably since old mirrored animations would fit just fine. Just another example of how things can get complicated in interesting ways at the crossroads of firearm design and handedness.
this awkwardly bent left forefinger is really not the best way to release the slide if there is a slide release on both sides of the gun. Reloading handguns one at a time on screen is fine when everything is depicted correctly, but it's the easier way. Isn't it fascinating that after all those years still nothing compares to Alien vs Predator and Castle Wolfenstein? In terms of innovation I mean. Silent Assassin and Contracts had the right idea, but besides correct models a lot of functional interaction between the hands and the gun wasn't animated. Other games and mods came close, but there would always be something missing. Killing Floor 2 gave us a more detailed rendition of Castle Wolfenstein Reload. More importantly, it gave us the final evolutionary step for a modern revolver reload with speed loaders. In the original game, models and animation were correct, but now, in addition to that, both guns are on screen the whole time. And revolvers are finally brought to the same level as semi-auto handguns. Although it lacks a lot of detail and function, this akimbo reload from the Half-Life mod had the right idea and it was released a year before Killing Floor 2. Codename Cure ticks all the boxes. Both guns on screen the whole time, non-mirrored models, correct reload. This is because both guns are ambidextrous by design and the mirrored slide release animation fits both. But this is such a lame win. If this is the end of this evolution, then it ended in 2009 with that fictional ambidextrous Glock. I need more. Deathloop had non-mirrored models and unique reload animations for each gun, but it was done one at a time. It didn't move things past what was already done in Call of Juarez, but it's nice to see this practice slowly take root. Dual wielding was added in Hunt Showdown sometime in 2020. Animations in this game are brilliant in general, but Akimbo reloads were the lame amalgamation of Alien vs Predator concept and Black Ops Python hidden reload. Simply put, it felt underwhelming. With the update also came a trait called ambidextrous. It speeds up the usual Akimbo reload for revolvers and introduces a new animation for the Mauser. The animation is technically correct and adds a bit of spectacle to the frame. More importantly, it can be added to that rare group of fully animated two-handed non-mirrored on-screen the whole time ambidextrous reload animations. It also gives us an Alien vs Predator variation of a speed loader reload in contrast to the one from Killing Floor. While Hunt firmly belongs to the Alien vs Predator branch, Red Dead 2 goes full Castle Wolfenstein. Holding an object in each hand at the same time naturally limits the range of motion for the fingers. Because of this, Arthur ignores some of the objects necessary to operate the firearm. But overall, his dual wielding animations are more than admirable. It's important to note that the setting of Red Dead 2 is such that it not only features different types of handguns, but it has variety among the subcategories as well. When using only one single action revolver, he uses the ejector rod, but when dual wielding them, he ignores it. Reloading is too quick in general, and he often magically spawns bullets and clips. And there are other mistakes and omissions, but at the same time, there's brilliant detail. Fingers turning the cylinder up and down. On a double action revolver, when reloading the left one, he keeps the cylinder in place with his finger. He engages levers and other mechanisms. Mauser reload is a more grounded version compared to the one in Hunt. And in general, there's a lot of unique animation for each hand. By this point, all the problems are pretty much solved one way or another, with different degrees of accuracy and attention to detail. But a revolver reload without a speed loader remains somewhat of a challenge. Coldwell 92 comes pretty close. It was added to the game this year and it has unique left and right animations for releasing the cylinder. Casings are ejected on screen in a manner that could be classified as simplification. Actual reload is unfortunately hidden, but we distinctly see the hand move from cylinder to cylinder and then both are slammed in the same direction. It almost ticks all the boxes for me. I just somehow find that kicking guns against each other is a shortcut and the hidden cylinders feel exceptionally lame in such a brilliantly animated game. But even if we accept this animation to be the final evolutionary step of a dual wielded revolver reload, a question poses itself that's sort of a challenge. Is this really the end of creativity when it comes to dual wielding and handedness? The most complicated revolver mechanics are the ones represented in Red Dead and Hunt, and both use the same skeleton from Aliens vs Predator and Wolfenstein, both with their omissions and shortcuts. Can it not be done any other way? It's not surprising at all that some of the best examples of reload animations are found outside of professional studios. One such example is this akimbo reload animation by Jeff Davantes. It starts out as the one in Castle Wolfenstein, but it ends in this brilliant variation where the right hand racks the slide on the left gun and then presses the slide release on the right one. 
This would be the most natural, most comfortable way to do this on two right-handed pistols. The left index finger doesn't have to be bent uncomfortably. Nothing unnecessarily spectacular happens and the uncomfortable act of having a piece of metal between the finger and another piece of metal happens only once instead of twice. Although he used an ambidextrous gun with a slide stop on both sides for the animation. This new Vegas mod comes pretty close, although just in its first part. Even though the avatar changes the whole cylinder for a new one, the animation is really nicely done, with details such as putting the hammer down and pulling the pin out. And although functionally incorrect, it does constitute a full reload with a lot of interaction between hands and firearm design. The right revolver is reloaded as if it wasn't a part of the akimbo pair. The problem of how to depict handedness when making the avatar ambidextrous because of dual wielding created a special category of quirky reloads that both defy the real life and in-game logic. In Brain Bread 2, revolvers are broken upon the initiation of the reload, then simply discarded after a quick inspection and replaced by two new ones. This of course never happened with a single revolver. These animations are flashy and impractical to various degrees, but are technically correct either in part or in their entirety. Sometimes they fit the overall aesthetic of the game, like those pistols from Shadow Warrior 2, which are racked by a backward jerk. But even here revolvers are mirrored, they couldn't find a solution there, not even a quirky one. This practice exists with equip animations as well, and here we see some of the most creative animations. Still, these overly stylish reloads are much better than magic or hidden reloads. Counter-Strike Online 2 features this parody of the double-barreled 1911, where two guns are taped together. We see clear Clearly that they are not mirrored, so when the avatar attempts to reload the guns he can reach only one magazine release, and so he discards the whole thing and pulls out another one. Since these are two guns, this is in fact dual wielding. And it's interesting in the context of this video because the reason the guns cannot be reloaded is that they're both made for right-handed people. The game also features the real thing, which does not have this problem since the barrels share controls. Gmod is a good place to find innovative reloads. I'll leave you with this example. A weapon mod called Project Fortuna has a mixed akimbo option featuring a revolver and a toggle action pistol. Somebody really wanted a challenge. By default you cannot mirror any portion of the animation because each handgun is operated differently. Magazine release on this boxy Luger is ignored, but the left thumb moves over the left frame the same way as in Payday to engage a non-existing cylinder release. The ejector rod is pressed down, but the toggle locks back magically. This animation cuts the line between the overly stylized reloads and the rest by being both. This is the half of that final evolutionary step for revolvers from Killing Floor 2, although done differently, more similar to that of Modern Warfare Reboot. Releasing the slide with the barrel of the other gun is the overly stylish part, but on a purely technical level it is the same as the one in Castle Wolfenstein. So much complication and history behind seemingly inconsequential aspects of video games. And if there is anything to be taken from this chapter, it is that unlike with the third person animation, the history of the phenomenon within the first person genres is larger than the history of the industry and studios. It has to include amateurs and enthusiasts if we want the full picture. To make things more complicated and expand the spectrum, there's another category that developed over the years. Even though Doom was an early example of cross-dominance, mixed-handedness came to have a different role to Undying, and its dual weapon system. Traces of this could be found earlier in Blood with certain pairs separated through controls. Mixing magic and physical weapons or other equipment kind of requires this approach, with the more dominant form of combat, one that's more essential to the gameplay, usually being reserved for the right hand and the secondary for the left. This was established as a trend early on and we find it today in pretty much the same state throughout various genres. Undying is a rare example of a game that reserves the right hand for non-physical weapons. We see this also 
echoing cry of fear when the phone light is turned on. Besides splitting hands on a control map, Undying had the option to make them work together by amplifying the effects of the physical weapon with the spell. The origin of cross dominance is entirely technical, but its true purpose is to give mechanical foundation to different playing styles. And now the feature is present in games like Assassin's Creed, where no magic is involved. Besides this technical aspect, cross dominance significantly alters the spectrum of handedness in video games. Two cases best exemplify the nature of this spectrum. The Monster Hunter series is a weird one. It features a lot of weapon types with particular and outlandish design, both in looks and mechanics. In order to accommodate such a wide spectrum of movement necessary to operate all these weapons, they've used a variety of options. The hunter appears to favor their left hand by default, as seen by the position and usage of their knife. They wield a sword, lance and glaive in their left hand, and bows, bow guns, long swords in their right, and when using the charge blade, they switch hands based on the weapon mod. They also dual wield swords. The other example is Red Dead Redemption 2, where Arthur uses both hands to pick stuff up and uses the left hand to fire guns only in three instances. When aiming from the left side of the cover, beyond a certain degree when aiming behind himself while on horseback, and when dual wielding. In all other instances, he shows a clear preference for the right hand. Unlike the hunter, Arthur is clearly not cross dominant. Red Dead 2 is without a doubt a game whose core design principle is realism. However, when it comes to handedness, it puts at odds two very different concepts that make the video game spectrum of handedness rather complicated. It depicts handedness both as a natural phenomenon and as a video game technicality. Naturally, Arthur can perform a whole variety of tasks using the left hand as well. For example, cigarettes and medicine are consumed with the right hand by default. However, if the right hand is occupied at the moment, Arthur smokes, eats, lights a match with his left hand. To illustrate how they got somewhat lost in the complexity of the game's depiction of handedness, take a look at these examples. If you draw objects from the pouch rather than from the wheel, Arthur holsters the gun but still proceeds to finish the action with his left hand and then draws the gun out again. If you try to eat while in cover with the left hand occupied, he switches hands. This almost feels like a glitch of sorts. It shows how complex the animation system of Red Dead Redemption 2 is in itself and in relation to objects and environment. If it wasn't for these three examples, Arthur could be classified as a right-handed person who occasionally uses his left hand for simpler tasks. Otherwise, he falls into that muddy part of the spectrum where hands are used with purely video game logic. When using a bolt-action rifle from the cover, we get a unique animation. The reason obviously being that its cycling animation cannot be mirrored like with the lever and pump action. When using that gun from the Texas School Book Depository, the animation isn't mirrored nor unique. We get that same obscured perspective. However, when using it while shooting from the horseback, there is a unique animation for it. Almost as if it's hidden, since many players will never encounter it. The same goes for the bow. These examples, the proficiency manifested through these animations, strongly imply that Arthur, even though not cross-dominant, is still something more than just right-handed. And he's not ambidextrous because he turns over carcasses so that he can skin them with the right hand. If he was, he would simply take the knife in his left hand. The whole animation set could be mirrored. He obviously has some unique video game form of handedness. After researching this subject and writing the script, I think the history of video game representations of handedness has really only three important moments. Metroid for recognizing handedness as a consistent phenomenon. Demon Souls for acknowledging a simple fact that a non-dominant hand can still be used with certain degree of functionality. Resident Evil 5 for depicting interaction between handedness and design of objects in a way that's consistent with its natural variety. Red Dead 2 has the most complex system after Demon Souls, but it doesn't really help us untangle this spectrum in a nice and clear way. It demonstrates that the usage of a hand and handedness as a preference are not the same, but it also preserves the notion that handedness can be whatever it is convenient for it to be from a design standpoint. So the inconsequential design that I was running away from during the whole video, in search of consistent and consequential depictions of handedness, are blended together in Red Dead 2. I'll talk about why I find this to be a problem in a few moments. With this, I've gone through only a small part of history of handedness of video game avatars. I've tried to focus as much as possible on functional handedness that's at least somewhat interactive. And I've barely scratched the surface. So why talk about this? Throughout my work so far, I've aspired to analyze themes and artistic elements of video games. This, in comparison, seems rather mundane and uninspiring. Let me try to explain my motivation in making this video. There are several reasons I have a slight obsession with this subject. 
from the appreciation of attention to detail, the sheer variety of design and problem solving behind it, to the consequences of that design, and the fundamental role depictions of handedness play in immersion in games with human or humanoid avatars, and how that challenges the nature of video games. I'll try to elaborate on some of them. First of all, there's the practical aspect of handedness. Despite the often proclaimed depths of human imagination, we often make fiction in our own image, meaning two hands. And we also imitate another matter of factness of life, dominant hands. Having human Human or humanoid avatars introduces the phenomenon of handedness to the gameplay by default, at least in a rudimentary sense. Video games being highly technical in nature and depending on the possibilities of that technology have a unique approach to handedness compared to literature or film. In literature, a character prefers whichever hand its author decides. In movies, most of the time, characters inherit the handedness of actors. In video games, the reason for handedness often has little to do with the phenomenon of handedness itself. Reasons behind the phenomenon of handedness in early video games, apart from the imitation of reference material, are technical limitations, circumstance and convenience. Sprite mirroring is a technical limitation, and it marked an entire era of video games. Doom Slayer's cross-dominance was a result of a person operating a camera and taking POV shots of props. His handedness is a result of the fact that cameras are designed for right-handed use. This is why the left hand is more prominent overall. It punches, it holds the visible portion of weapons, it reloads. Whatever variant of handedness these examples represent, they represent it only in appearance, no conceptual or mechanical foundation. The first example that features handedness as a deliberate design is Metroid, where handedness is based on character lore. Then we have characters like Link, who remains the most popular lefty, although he's now a righty, and he started out as an ambidextrous character. The history of Link's handedness best illustrates the trends throughout the industry. There are over 20 main and spin-off games in the series, and Link went through all three categories across the titles. During the 2D era he was ambidextrous because of sprite mirroring, although promotional art depicted him as left-handed. He became left-handed in Ocarina of Time in 98, the first 3D game in the series. As mentioned before, there simply was no reason to switch hands since the avatar could be turned around the axis and face enemies in all directions, while all of its sides continued to exist within that world. World. Link therefore remained left-handed until the introduction of Nintendo Wii. Twilight Princess came out in 2006. It was originally planned as a GameCube exclusive, but was ultimately ported to Wii as well. In the GameCube version, Link is canonically left-handed. However, during the development of the Wii version, developers thought it would be too awkward for the right-handed majority of players to swing the Wii mode with their right hand in order to control the sword in Link's left hand, and so the whole map was flipped. That this was merely a technical convenience convenience and not canon seems to be proved by the fact that 8 out of 9 games released after that feature Link as left-handed, all except Skyward Sword. However, when Breath of the Wild came out in 2017 using both motion controls and traditional buttons, Link was suddenly right-handed again. And to continue the confusion, in the 2019 remake of Link's Awakening for Switch, Link is left-handed, while in the 2021 remaster of Skyward Sword, he is right-handed. This complicated saga best exemplifies how representations of handedness in video games have their own reasons and logic. Link's canonical left-handedness is neither lore-based nor a result of some technicality, but reportedly circumstantial, as its creator is ambidextrous but favors his left hand and likes to make his character such. Link's right-handedness is a result of the correlation between design and marketing. A similar thing happened with Counter-Strike. The default option for the avatar in the original game was left-handed. The reason being that Min Lee, one of the guys behind the mod, dared to impose his birthmark onto millions of righties. This was the practice until Global Offensive. The practical thing was the option to choose the dominant hand for the avatar in order to make the visual response to your input more familiar to that of your own preference. Besides personal preference, this has practical implications considering the competitive nature of the gameplay where the phenomenon of ocular dominance or eye preference plays a significant role. And with the option to bind hand switching to a key, players could change it depending on on the side of the corner they are coming up to. Some other fast-paced competitive shooters like Quake 2, Unreal Tournament and Team Fortress 2 had this option, as well as Die Hard Vendetta. After that, it disappears for quite a while and if you try to research the subject, you'll see a lot of lefties complaining about competitive shooters not having this option. We see it again in Valorant in 2020. This remains such a fascinating case study. It is one of the best examples of complexity created by the attempt to reconcile the phenomenon of handedness, firearm mechanics and 
gameplay conventions. Lee was tailoring these guns to himself, first and foremost, but at the same time he was minding gameplay implications. He used a variety of solutions. Some gun models are correct, and their default animations are first examples of correct left-handed operation of a right-handed design. Just to help you place that into context, that is Sheva all the way back in 99. For pistols he mirrored only one half of the gun, so that functions like slide stop or magazine release would fit a left-handed avatar. This way he had effectively made those guns left-handed by design and escaped having to animate the unique way a left-handed person would operate right-handed firearms, which is why they had to be mirrored for the right hand. On shotguns he ignored the loading port, which makes them effectively ambidextrous. MP5 he mirrored partially, in order to have that charging handle closer to the right hand. A whole list of problems and solutions that would be solved years later. These original animations with correct gun models are quite nice, too bad we don't see them often. Most reload compilations you find online showcase the mirrored variant. Min Lee somehow started what must be one of the weirdest practices in video game history. A deliberate mirroring of firearm models. This created a rather weird situation where the majority of right-handed characters use rare, often fictional, left-handed weapons. The inspiration behind this certainly seems to be his left-handedness and the mirroring of his left-handed animations. The widely accepted explanation as to why it took root is that it's more visually interesting to look at the ejection port with shells ejected across the screen and bolts and charging handles operated at the center of the frame for a more dynamic effect. It made its way into so many games that it's not a rare sight even these days. Ironically, we hear realism-oriented gamers complain about these left-handed guns all the time. They are the most left-handed thing about the FPS genre without doubt. Examining practical implications of handedness in video games is also interesting from a purely historic aspect. This seemingly unimportant and secondary feature has garnered so much history from the 90s until now. Still, comparing it to other mediums, it's easy to find it lacking in many aspects. One of the most notable lefties of the moving picture is John McClane. Throughout the film, he uses firearms made for right-handed people. The character wasn't originally left-handed, casting Bruce Willis created this problem. How the production team responded to this discrepancy created an example where handedness is of consequence on both a technical and narrative level. This is best exemplified through the modification made to the Beretta used by Bruce Willis. Its slide stop was kept on the left side of the gun, but extended so that it's easier to engage with the upper part of the left forefinger. Magazine release was switched to the other side so that it could be engaged with the thumb. There are several close-ups throughout the film, where these modifications are seen in detail. Without ever being directly referred to, this creates an implication that Detective McLean had the gun modified for himself. And then, out of countless uniform firearms, this one stands out and gains, in addition to the status of the film, its own collectible value. It becomes an object with a story. Circumstance would have it that there is an old piece of abandoned ware called Die Hard Nakatomi Plaza. And the second brilliant thing about it, after its existence, is that it stayed true to John McClane's handedness. Now, some gun models are mirrored in order to match this, but if you look closely, you'll see that the Beretta has the magazine release on the right side of the gun. It's no more than cosmetic consistency, but it's nice. Now, in addition to the animated trigger finger, trigger and hammer. He releases the slide stop with his index finger, the way John McClane slash Bruce Willis does on the modified movie Beretta. Truly brilliant considering that this was all the way back in 2002. Whatever mechanism makes babies left-handed during their development is what gave us this example. What was happening in Mrs. Willis's womb had ultimately influenced how handedness was represented in this game. Think about that for a second. Bruce Campbell is also left-handed, which is why Ash in Evil Dead 2 loses his right hand. This is then reflected in all 3D games in the series. Besides the practical and circumstantial origins of handedness, sometimes the phenomenon brings on a narrative layer. Dunban from Xenoblade Chronicles is originally right-handed, but suffers injury and adapts to using his left hand. His handedness becomes a part of his story. In Tales of the Abyss, handedness plays a role in the narrative, differentiating the two central characters. Luke is the good guy, and a clone of Ash, the original anti-hero. Ash was in fact left-handed himself, but switched hands to differentiate himself from his replica. After a series of events, the identity of the remaining character is brought into question. In one scene towards the end, a character extends his left hand for a handshake, knowing that he's left-handed, and he lifts his right hand, stops for a second, then completes the handshake with his left hand, leaving the player with a sort of cliffhanger as to who that actually is. Hatem Kenway wears his primary hidden blade on his right wrist, contrary to a long-standing tradition. He is otherwise shown to be ambidextrous, highlighting his dual legacy within both factions and singling him out.
Nero is left-handed while his right hand is possessed by some demonic power, which is an interesting inversion of the sinister left-hand trope. The ominous three fingers in Elden Ring are a part of the left hand as well. Right-handedness is the default option. Usually developers are so biased towards right-handedness that every NPC in the game is right-handed. But when it comes to the narrative, left-handedness has a dedicated role more often. Left-handed characters are important, if for nothing else than for their representation of a real-life phenomenon. But if that left-handedness is of no consequence, if it's just shallow decoration, an outdated trope, if it's just mirrored right-handedness, then there's little to talk about. I know that even mere representations of left-handedness mean a lot the lefty players, but without functional consequences, it's not really a worthy representation. You know who else was surface level left handed? That guy from that one mission in GTA 5 whom you kill just because he's the only left handed person at a party. Handedness, after all, manifests through action. Animation is an imitation of life, and handedness can come to life in a video game only through animation. Sheva's animation set captures the uniqueness of the experience of being left handed in a right handed world. Throughout the act of her adapting to a right-handed firearm, the game had adapted to her handedness. One of the most memorable examples of this is Private Jackson from Saving Private Ryan, who is left-handed and shoots a Springfield rifle made for right-handed usage. He operates the bolt with his dominant hand, reaching over the scope and this awkwardness of movement is visually distinctive and singles him out. Particularly eye-catching are the few moments where it appears he struggles to pull the bolt back. Some cycles seem clumsy, others skillful and dexterous. It remains one of the most distinctive representations of handedness in my catalog. What I particularly like about it is that the practical aspect is merged with the narrative one. Besides practical reasons, this subject is interesting to me for the variety of details it brings. Some years back we saw a rise in the appreciation of unique details in video games. Quite a number of YouTube channels are entirely based on picking out peculiar details and making compilations out of them. Incredible attention to detail became the new living, breeding world. This seems to be the trend across the industry, but it's more prominent with some developers. I'm not talking about hidden stuff, notes from developers or fourth wall breaking. Systems, animations, models have become more complex and intricate. But it would be a complete misrepresentation of the state of facts to say that video games weren't detailed in the past. We only need to look at examples such as original Fallout, obviously made by a passionate team led by an artistic vision. But it's undeniable that technological advancements made a certain new standard possible. This progression was natural, from an object barely having a physical representation in the world to resting in a cupboard in an actual video game space. And there are, within industry, design philosophies pushing towards higher levels of realism and pseudo-realism. This has affected the way in which handedness is portrayed. It had certainly created an expectation. We admired the sun shining through an earlobe, particularly satisfying animation. The way glass shatters, rope physics. We respect that extra attention and praise artistry for its own sake. I find this to be deeper than just facts and trivia. Humans admire the passion and smart and skillful actions of other humans. So besides exploring the history of handedness, part of my motivation here is the appreciation of such detail, plain and simple. This attention to detail is an opportunity for developers and artists to manifest their love for the craft. Somehow, I have a feeling that the production team liked the challenge of adapting that unique Beretta to Bruce Willis, or that Spielberg liked the fact that he made left-handed Barry Popper operate the rifle in such a distinctive manner in order to give the character that special flavor. Thanks to such love of the craft, we are able to highlight unique solutions that add some variety. Miami Vice has this interesting variation where the avatar sits behind cover instead of crouching, which changes his stance, pace and directly correlates with handedness. It's one of those games where handedness was represented consistently. This led to a rather peculiar animation when aiming from the left side of the cover. It looks a bit unintuitive, but still reveals less than this, and is surely more comfortable than this. I find that consistency with regards to character's handedness creates more interesting animations. In Modern Warfare 2, when a knife is paired with a pistol, the reload animation is slightly different. In Splinter Cell Double Agent, the pistol holster sits on Sam's right thigh, and so despite his ambidexterity, he still has to switch hands in order to put it away. It's nice to see this action actually animated, considering how much teleportation there is when it comes to hand switching or storing weapons. Uncharted 4 is also very specific about this. Mafia 2 had several postures for each weapon type. 
In a cover-based shooter, this adds the necessary variety, as you are constantly looking at the same animation. Sometimes the solution to this problem is directly tied to the overall aesthetic of the game. My favorite example of this is the complication with regards to handedness in the realistic approach of Max Payne. He can carry three guns at the same time, but he can permanently holster only two handguns. He can hold a rifle while using the handgun, and in order to use the rifle he has to holster the pistol. But if he wants to dual wield handguns, he has to drop the rifle. Guns don't just disappear under his shirt, they are limited by the fact that he has only two hands, and there's a unique animation when reloading a handgun while holding the rifle, where he lifts it up under his arm to free his left hand. This feels like a system where character's handedness is actually implemented into the game as a mechanic. Something similar was later used in Red Dead 2. Look at the way it deals with hands as slots when dual wielding. You can assign two handguns as default, and you can draw each gun with the right hand as a single weapon. By default, the second gun from the offhand holster is assigned to the left hand. So if you draw it first, Avatar always switches it into the left hand before drawing from the default holster. From that point, you can reholster and redraw the offhand revolver as much as you want, and it's always done with the left hand and a unique animation. You can switch it back to the right hand by holstering the default gun, either by switching hands or holstering and then redrawing from the offhand holster. Quite a bit of variety with regards to something simple as drawing and holding a gun. I believe this attention to detail can be used to great effect. We also see this variety and attention to detail with regards to how Arthur opens doors and climbs up on a horse depending on which hand is occupied. Remember how iconic the sight of inversed Stratocaster played by Jimi Hendrix is? A right-handed object adjusted for left-handed use. An immediate layer of meaning and story. First you have a spontaneous reaction just by seeing a well-established pattern broken. An iconic guitar shape turned upside down. Then you notice he's left-handed and can deduce further that in the lack of a proper left-handed guitar, which was probably harder to procure and more expensive, he modified the default option himself, learned to play it that way and got used to it. Once he became rich, he continued the practice for whatever reason. Layers of story and meaning are added as you explore deeper. If we just look at shooters, there is quite a lot of repetition in the way interaction with firearms is animated. Objectively speaking, there's just not that many ways you can reload a gun. And don't forget that we still have mirrored or magical reloads. I think it's time for a left-handed first-person perspective avatar, in a setting with right-handed weapons. Something with the standard of new Battlefield games or modern warfare reboots. We've had right-handed avatars using right handed and left handed weapons throughout the history of FPS. This would be a new challenge for the animation team. This is why we have to go back to the actual creative process. To that moment an animator realizes the animation doesn't correspond to the firearm design and what happens inside of them once they make this realization. This problem has far more reaching implications than mere technicalities. What's fascinating to me is that a person working on this animation had had to at one point come to the realization that these gun models were made for right handed people and therefore right handed video video game characters. The reason behind this whole video is the appreciation of what they did after that. Somewhere along the lines developers started to take this into account and we see giveaways of that consciousness, such as fictional ambidexterity on certain handguns in Modern Warfare 2 and guns going back into the right hand for the reload. Ambidexterity as a part of the cover mechanic created some interesting variation that challenges the game at multiple levels. Sometimes with non-sticking cover systems it seems as if the avatar is confused as to when to switch hands. Cover angles, proximity of objects, side of the cover, they all come into play. In Conviction for some reason the avatar changes hands when reloading a gun. In 40th Day when you change the side of the cover in the middle of the reload, the animation first plays out and then the avatar switches hands. In Future Soldier the avatar prematurely moves his hand to the position where it should be in a left-handed stance in the middle of an animation as the left hand is still completing its portion of the right-handed reload. I know there's a lot of gamers who have never considered video games to be anything other than entertainment and sports, but the argument for their status as art has been present for decades. The origin of that argument is both the distinctive authorship of certain directors and studios and reported experiences from the players. Because of this, comparison to other, more mature forms of art is inevitable. It's hard to use animals as actors and film chase scenes and operate all this equipment, but humans do it and they want to do it better the next time. Not to mention the act of facing an empty page and having to write something on it. 
all of which is done in reality that we only partially control. Video games, on the other hand, operate within a reality that's fully under the control of developers. And when we take into consideration things like losing weight, copying an accent, or learning a complex skill for a role, compared to such examples of dedication to the craft, video games can seem less serious. I find that in video games we often accept inconsequential design as necessary, not important, disconnected from the rest of the game. One thing that makes the animation work behind Sheva all the more brilliant is how unnecessary it was compared to basically the whole history of handedness in video games up to that point. This was a deliberate complication. They could have simply mirrored it and saved themselves a lot of time and work. But we would never hear that kind of argument in movies and literature. Instead, we praise the love of craft exhibited there. Bottom line is, if developers are going to implement something, they should accept its consequences as well. A video game is all of its parts. But I think the issue of handedness, as presented in this analysis, is at the core of the discussion that ultimately defines the identity of video games as a format. Representations of handedness being only one part of that discussion. Behind these technicalities and details and love of the craft, through the representations of handedness we can examine the very nature of video games as a phenomenon. It is a matter of what is acceptable, what is believable, what is or isn't a part of the game to the point that it takes away from it or makes it better, but even more, that it makes it what it is. It's about what, despite its fictional nature, can and cannot be. A set of design principles built onto each other, creating an overall consistency of design and experience that elevates the game to another level of form. The idea is that a game is something as a whole, and not an accidental combination of systems. Earlier, when I talked about different trends being established throughout the industry, there were a few particularly interesting examples for this argument. Why did The Last of Us move to a consistently right-handed avatar? Why did Lincoln get a left-handed set of animations? Why did Wolfenstein and Deathloop create unique animations for the left hand? What prompted developers to allocate time and resources for this? What logic or design philosophy was behind them? What does it say about the direction the design principles have taken across time? I'll try to answer these questions. Handedness as a phenomenon might seem unimportant in your gameplay experience. After all, we play shooters to shoot, we play strategy games to strategize, we play racing games to race. The focus is always on an activity, a gameplay loop. But if we decide that the interaction between the representation of handedness and the in-game world is of little consequence for the game, then what else is on the table? Characters here, their outfit, weather system. What else is so unimportant to the gameplay that it could be left out or depicted without much attention? This line of thinking would pretty soon lead us to the lack of variety and artistry whose shapes we can surely see even now. On the other hand, is the phenomenon of handedness somehow more important than, let's say, outfits? Perhaps to the point of its interactability, but not too much. With human and humanoid avatars, handedness is an essential part of their being and therefore crucial in their interaction with the world, often prominently, crucially. How works of fiction define their inner logic and rules often defines what they are, not just in terms of genre or style, but the work itself. All is Quiet on the Western Front is a brutal portrayal of war and how it affects the human psyche and society. Its framework is realism. I'm not saying that it would be a lesser work if dragons appeared in the story, but it would certainly be a different story. And beyond any single work, a framework has to be established in general, otherwise every work would seem like a randomly generated story with no binding rules to the setting, physics, nature of human relations and so on. Restrictions can end up defining a work of fiction stylistically more than creativity, because they force authors to give meaning to their creativity within a limited framework. This is where portrayals of handedness often betray an otherwise deeply established inner logic in video games. It is often the case that immersion is achieved by imitating reality. The so-called realism simply counts on the familiarity of the already established rule set of our world to create a sense of internal consistency. Things like car damage and death are good examples, especially death, since it breaks and creates its immersion at the same time. By the time I finished GTA 3, Claude has been successfully revived a hundred times after burning to death, drowning and dying from all other deaths made possible by the physics engine. This breaks the immersion of a living, breathing world, quite cruelly, but without it, it would be cartoonish. It's a delicate act of balancing. 
but a piece of fiction in whatever form still has to have rules, even if the rule is that the setting doesn't have rules. For example, a world where physical laws are bound only by the whimsical creativity of its author. A work is what its parts make it out to be, together and by their single selves. See how this goes right into the question of the nature of the work. If I can accept dragons, it doesn't mean I have to accept them with dexterity. So technically, consistency and internal logic are the backbone of immersion, not realism. How a video game relates to the internal logic established within tells a lot about what kind of a game it is. Just like picking out a setting determines what sort of cars will be driven around the city, so does this nature of the game, this internal logic, determine the whole experience. This is how both Stanley Parable and World at War can be immersive. They respect their internal logic to a high degree. We often talk about immersion as if it's some special effect in the game, when it's in fact the game itself. It has to be designed into the game from the ground up. With time, this became a trend. As games have set themselves up to a higher standard, so have more aspects of their design gained the ability to stick out as inconsistent. Yeah. Something seemingly unimportant can be annoying and pull away the attention from the good parts of the game. The game itself, its rules that form expectations, constantly create problems for inconsistent design. The real problem with ambidexterity is that it's fake. Sprite mirroring doesn't constitute true ambidexterity, as only one side of the character exists at any point in time. So it would be more precise to say that the avatar is left-handed when facing the left side of the screen and right-handed when facing the right side of the screen. It cannot be ambidexterity because the letters are reversed. Eye patches magically appear on the other eye, etc. Only a game where the only rule is that there are no rules could sustain such inconsistencies. Most of the time this mirroring is simply an act of teleportation. It feels a bit jarring once you notice it. Once we enter the 3D era, most situationally ambidextrous avatars are suspiciously biased towards their right hand in all other activities. Almost to the point that it makes me think they're actually right-handed and this ambidexterity thing is just a convenient solution for developers. Max's ambidexterity disappears outside of dual wielding. Joel has a clear preference for the right hand in all activities outside of cover, shoulder switch and looting. He knocks people out with his right hand, shifts them, opens a lock, it's clear that he is right handed. Even Lincoln, whose ambidexterity is substantiated with a separate set of reload animations, shows a clear preference for his right hand during takedowns, when firing from the hip and through general interaction. The same is true in first person shooters. That distinctive lack of preference often disappears outside of dual wielding and the character proceeds to do everything with their right hand. Such inconsistencies especially stick out in games whose aesthetic relies on realism. Most games have their framework of reality based on ours, and either-handedness within most of these frameworks is still perceived as a rare trait. Cars, guns, clothes, all look similar to ours, so where do all these ambidextrous people come from? The problem is one of consistency. Consistency with the character you played as up to the point you took cover. Even the ambidextrous shoulder switch feature betrays itself. You aim with the left shoulder, go back to neutral stance, the gun goes back into the right hand. You aim again, right hand is the default. To access this ambidexterity, you first have to use the right hand ambidexterity locked behind right-handedness. Through this feature, ambidexterity became a thing outside of cover systems. You can simply switch it while aiming for clearer vision, making a game more convenient for the player for no reason at all at the cost of the game's integrity. Sometimes this inconsistency strikes at the core of the game's believability because of the characters. For example, in Vanquish, I simply don't care what hand the avatar uses. It's not that kind of a game. In Dog Days, on the other hand, I cannot accept that after how Lynch is portrayed, he's so proficient with both hands. He should barely be able to fire with his default dominant hand. It's easier to accept them with dexterity on a super soldier than on an ordinary criminal. It seems kind of lazy that so many third-person characters are ambidextrous, especially if aimed to be perceived as ordinary people. In Mafia, the fact that Tommy is an everyman is a very important part of the story and its themes. That he's so proficient with firearms and with both hands seriously jeopardizes the presumption of his ordinariness. Did he also go through some special training like Lincoln, or is he just a part of that suspiciously large ambidextrous club? These characters are ambidextrous without a proper in-game reason, never explained through story, nor justified through in-game lore. After the second game, assassins began wearing dual hidden blades as default weapon from the start. In many cases this didn't make any sense, considering the knowledge and training required for it. In addition to that, many of them didn't even have a gauntlet on the other hand. 
the blade would simply materialize from the sleeve, which is quite lame. The Parisian Brotherhood, on the other hand, appears to be more traditional. Arno wears a single blade on his left hand and has unique double kill animations and I like this variety a lot more. Only a small portion of characters that use both hands with the same proficiency have personas and backgrounds that create enough of a benefit of the doubt. An example like Sheva is important, not just for setting an example and a standard, not just for being creative compared to other depictions of handedness, but for establishing an internal logic that is the basis of what a video game is. Once you see Sheva reload the gun that way, it is considerably safer for you to assume that this is a world with consequences. Besides this fundamental believability established by the setting and character, there are statistical considerations involved in the benefit of the doubt. Ambidexterity is quite a rare phenomenon. It is estimated that only about 1% of the global population is naturally ambidextrous. With these numbers in mind, we are not to accept so easily that all these characters were ambidextrous just like that. It's kind of cartoonish. This creates a rather bizarre situation where lefties are overlooked because they are a minority in real life, but then an even smaller group of people are overrepresented because of how developers solved a practical problem. If this discussion and problematization of fake ambidexterity is too nuanced and close to nitpicking, magic definitely isn't. In a video game with a third-person perspective, animations are essential to the experience. Simply mirroring the whole gun in its animation set feels incredibly lazy, uncraftsmanlike. In Days Gone, the very nature of reality of the game's world is brought into question. Deacon carries magic in his hands. Using the same principle as sprite mirroring, the entire gun is flipped together with the animation. This puts the game at odds with itself, as it takes great care in depicting various other details of its setting. It goes to great lengths to make us feel like we are inhibiting a world of consequences by following a strict set of rules like bike maintenance and gas consumption. And then it shrugs off the matter of handedness and its connection to firearm mechanics nonchalantly. Even most first person shooters don't have this good of a revolver reload. The process of reloading in general is animated with great detail, but then an important interaction between handedness and firearm mechanics is left to be completely governed by magic. Something stubbornly impractical, as seen in GTA 4, 5 or Max Payne, would fit this gritty post-apocalyptic survival adventure much better, more organically. The character would be trapped into what they are, instead even those firearms that can be reloaded with either hand by design are mirrored for some reason. With regards to the fundamental believability when it comes to handedness, particularly ambidexterity, there is a very good example where it is used with a specific purpose and in a way that's believable and actually makes the work more immersive. Judge Holden of Texas is either handed as a spider, and this is a trait specifically reserved for this character, and it is truthful to the hints of his otherworldliness. It reflects the fact that the guy considers most things in existence to be without his consent. The fact that he hasn't a single hair on his body, is of gigantic stature, claims that the god hasn't interfered in the degeneracy of mankind at least as of 1849, and so on. Compare this to Ellie, and it just chips away something from the character. No way she's ambidextrous just like that. The other playable character also was, and the guy before him, and his two younger selves. Come on. Deacon doesn't believe that the freedom of birds is an insult to him. He hasn't learned Dutch off a Dutchman, isn't a cunning old malabarista, wouldn't pass for a thespian, doesn't consider war to be God, does sleep and will probably die. So there's no reason for him to be ambidextrous like Judge Holden of Texas, except for this convenience of design that is at odds with pretty much everything else in the game. Compared to an example like this, ambidexterity of most video game characters feels like a superpower. There's just no justification for it outside of the gameplay, and games are much more than just gameplay. What I'd like to see in video games and what this discussion boils down to is more consequential and consistent representations of handedness. In my Far Cry 3 video I've talked about how great it would have been if Jason's progression was represented through hand animation instead of a skill tree. We've already seen examples where the avatar contains progression within itself, something that can be changed throughout the game. Hands can be a part of that. One of the best examples of that is how Modern Warfare Reboot represented skill and age through animation. Although at the very precipice of realism itself, it was impactful and memorable. I hope this video has fleshed out for you what I came to discover while researching for the script that was initially to be a much shorter analysis, but kept expanding with the complexity of the subject, which is that even a seemingly minor aspect of video games can gather so much history and variation and cause so much trouble. Art of animation, craftsmanship, consistency of design and overall design philosophy, immersion. At the crossroads of all this is the phenomenon of handedness. Thank you for your time. I hope you've enjoyed this video. 
A very special thanks goes to my Patreon supporters, whose names you can see on the screen. Until next time, have a nice day.